frank these days, but it was sort of frank confession, very frank, embarrassingly frank, uh, of, of how a story gets made from, from, from me in hopes that that will somehow uh, enlighten the critical conversation as well. In other words, those two things are not actually as separate as we often make them. Uh, now, when I was a younger writer, um, and again, coming from working class Chicago, uh, the only mm, interaction I had with text was in school. Uh, and in high school, of course, the, the kind of ambient assumption is a version of, of the intentional fallacy, which is the writer knew exactly what he meant to do. You know, walked in, sit there with your reader, brought in his manure truck full of concepts, <laughs> which he was totally sure, and dumped them on you, and you were great. Uh, so, and then we took these, uh, and for the first time, mad writers, <clears throat> visiting writers would come in, and often the, the, the talks they gave were some version of, well, I was hoping they you know, interrogate patriarchy, 15th <laughs> century hockey, as, you know, and of course, you know, green and wild. And, and I was like, oh, I, I'm in the wrong job. <laughs> so, for me, I don't know how detail this, but for me, the, uh, the process of going from writing more abundant stories uh, in which all the control was kept to, to the author, to go from those to writing some little pathetic attempts that had some life in them. That process had to do with accepting certain parts of myself that I hadn't previously recognized as literary. In other words, for me, the main thing is to say, well, uh, as a young kid, I thought I was making this formidable intellectual uh, scale model uh, with a great deal of control, and you would accept it and be grateful. <laughs> the, different, the model that I arrived at was much closer to stand up. You know, uh, it was something during which you actually surrendered control of the artist, in a systematic way, if you can call that. You surrendered control, and in a sense, your uh, conceptual mind proceeds a little bit, a lot. And there's something else working through you that uh, is not, I mean, it's hard to talk about this thing without sounding a little new age and quasi, but having been in his presence for so many years, I know it's as real as anything uh, more solid. It's, 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 it's reproducible, it's reliable, uh, and it guides you to higher ground. So I, I want to kind of talk about uh, the process by which I arrived at this, this understanding. And again, my, my point is, um, you know, a few years ago I gave a talk, a uh, series about kindness, so kind of a graduation talk. Um, part of the intention of that was to say, there is this set of behaviors called kindness or empathy compassion, which kind of get shunted over with new age books or, or the religious books, but actually is uh, uh, historically something that is intellectually uh, solid. It's something that all, all cultures have understood. Kindness actually is a set of behaviors that can be uh, observed and reproduced and so on. So let me talk a little bit about the, the process. And again, the intention is just to say, although this stuff is hard to talk about, uh, and it's basically a form of intuition, it still deserves a play at, at the adult table. Uh, if we're going to honestly talk about art uh, in our time, uh, if we're going to let art be a substantial player in our culture, which recent events have indicated we better start doing soon, then I think we need to develop a vocabulary to account for uh, the aspects of art production that aren't really and aren't conceptual and aren't uh, certainly lovely. So, um, I, can, I can kind of trace this, this back to the one moment. Uh, this leads into Bardo, people have said this is my first novel. It's actually my second. And the first was a fiasco. Uh, when my wife and I were first married, we had no money, we had two babies at home, uh, and I was working as a tech writer and really struggling, doing a lot of heavy meditation at, at work. You know, Nick walked into the Walmart. That <laughs> 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 wasn't going anywhere. And again, I was operating on the assumption that I had to know exactly what you were going to feel exactly which part of the story. Stay married to me. Right, so then uh, a friend of mine from Chicago was getting married in Los Angeles, Mexico, and my wife said, let's let's just take what we have, we'll send you, you can go by yourself, uh, just have a good time. So I got on to Mexico, and it's every young writer's dream. It's uh, a radical Catholic priest from the south side, uh, a male model slash uh, surfer is in the wedding party. There's a guy who just got out of the Joliet State Prison uh, in the wedding party. Beautiful, you know, Mexican workout. So I came back from that 
Wendy and I said to my wife, I actually said this, I mean, you're sitting on a gold mine. <laughs> I got it. Just let me run here. <laughs> so, so I started writing, and I was working full time with Edna Biggs. So I come home from work and, uh, you know, help with the kids. Everybody go to bed, and I'd have a pot of coffee. And sometimes I was being really back in uh, a bottle of Boone's Farm, which I didn't have. <laughs> so I wrote, over the course of a year, I wrote this massive 700 page novel. Uh, and I can give you the whole, you know, a full assessment of its value by telling you the title. Uh, La Bona de Eduardo. That's <laughs> way. Uh, so, of course, at the time, I thought it was quite good. And, uh, and I gave it to my wife. And uh, I'll never forget, this is a major artistic moment. I left the room and kind of did that thing where you just take your time. <laughs> and that person first outside the door with a gargoyle. And um, she may have got to page six. And she was sitting like this. <laughs> and just, you know, it's one of the things that uh, a writer learns is that you already know the answers to talk. And sometimes it just takes some particular to turn you right on. So as soon as I saw that posture, I was like, that didn't make it. And I knew why. And I know why all along. Um, so then I went to work the next day, very depressed. Uh, you know, resolved never to give my wife any degree again, although I knew she was right. Um, but then an interesting thing happened. I was in a conference call and um, just taking notes. That was kind of my job. And it was so boring. It was a particularly slow conference call. But I started just almost out of the corner of my eye writing these little associated poems for our kids were a little time with three Dr. Susan. And they were all just da 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 da. Kind of pornographic, uh, a, a little sci fi, just whatever, really a whole <laughs> type of stream of language uh, with no worries about me at all the poem and then I draw a little drawing and flip the page over just as a way of, of not running out of the room screaming it was so dull um, so at the end of the call I had this little pile of papers and I almost threw them away something held me back brought them home gave them to, or just left them on the dining room table went in to play with the kids and I heard this magical sound uh, from the next room that I hadn't heard with respect to my work in many years my wife laughing with pleasure just laughing out loud now, up to that time, I'd been getting from my wife and all my other writing friends this, this reaction, which is, I read your story, <laughs> you know, or, or even worse is, it w you know, it was interesting, it, ah, you know. Uh, so, but this was, this was a genuine emotional reaction, and I would say it was a complicated reaction. There, there was no sense on her end that she was in control of a reaction. It was just a spontaneous um, uh, reaction to something that she didn't quite understand, but that was sort of knocking her askew a bit. So now in the MFA world, we tend to work on the assumption that you give me your story, I make some measured intelligent comments, you process those, give it to me again, and at some point we arrive at excellence. That can work. It, it often does work. This thing that happened to me was much more like a catastrophic break. There was um, this uh, moment where I thought, oh my God, all this time, it had been six or seven years since I left grad school at this point, I hadn't written anything that had any life in it. All that time I felt like I had been sort of, uh, it, it, it reminded me of you're in, a, in, a, in an alley and you're getting your ass kicked and you can't, and there's, and there's kindergartners that are kicking your ass. You can't, um, what, how is this possible? Then you realize that you've had both arms behind your back. For me, what that meant was all this time after grad school, I had been denying myself certain uh, natural inclinations that I have had since I was a tiny kid, I can remember, to be funny. Uh, I've always used it as a tension abater, or if I'm I was trying to uh, date somebody, trying to get out of trouble, trying to apologize. Humor was always the first, to, just intuitively. Um, also, uh, you know, I'm a fast talker, south side fast talker. That was absent from that early work. Uh, I'm also a real lover of pop culture. That was absent. Uh, and the biggest thing that was absent was uh, any recognition of class. Now, looking back, that's the story of my life. You know, uh, I recently found some old journals from when I was a, a carefree hippie uh, in, the, in the 80s when, uh, in LA. And I remember that time as being sort of the, you know, the, the, the blissful beatnik years when I wasn't worried about anything. My God, every page has a reference to money in it. If I can just get $60, I owe this guy this, no lunch today, you know. 
Um, so in these early Hemingway-esque attempts, there was no um, uh, awareness of money as a thing. Um, Terry Eagleton said, capitalism plunders the sensuality of the body. There was no recognition of that. In fact, there was a very energetic denial of it. A lot of my stories were set in exotic locales where I hadn't been, you know, where people of leisure were fishing or, you know, dis discussing something. So, uh, but again, I want to stress, this, not, none of this was in my head at the time. The, the only impulse was I made my wife laugh. Uh, I made her laugh with a, a kind of complicated, uncomfortable laughter. So, now, this is something I, I can say is factually true. I can't explain it, but a switch got thrown in my head. You know, if my stance before had been this, I, I'm going to write a, a carefully wrought story in the Hemingway-esque tradition to evoke emotions A, B, and C and control the material. The switch all of a sudden was, I'm going to, and I would have said entertain. That was, you, know, I, you see, I introduced that word a little, a little carefully here in, in academia, but that was really the feeling was, I'm going to be frickin' Steve Martin, if I can. I want you to be uh, drawn into the story in a way that's undeniable by whatever means necessary, and I don't get to choose the means, you know. When you're a young writer, you think, I'll enter into lineage X with Hemingway, Carver, and then me, you know. Uh, <laughs> The lineage doesn't work that way. You don't get to apply for membership. What you get to do is sweat over your stories for a long time, and you look up, and you'll find that you're in a lineage, but it's not by your choosing. The other way to say this is, you know, if someone said, I, I really uh, am going to be the heir to Shostakovich and write string quartets in a minor key that will be very, you know, mordant. Uh, but whenever you did that, everybody fell asleep. But you notice that whenever you picked up an accordion, everyone danced. Well, guess what? You know, you've just found, found your lineage. So this was an invigorating uh, moment for me. And just the, the uh, sort of acquiescence to being an entertainer. Uh, and again, and we can talk about the definition of entertainment. But, but that was, in my own mind, it was, oh, I'm allowed to please. That was maybe the biggest phrase. I'm allowed to please now. Lo and behold, once I made that allowance for myself, I knew how to do it. And the main symptom of this new mode of writing was that I always had strong opinions. When I was in the, the Fall Hemingway phase, I would get to a certain juncture at the story and I just would have no idea which way to go. And what I would do, dooming myself, is I'd refer to the Hemingway. What did he do in Indian camp, you know? And then sort of with these little tweezers, try to pick up that thing and transfer it to my story and, you know. So, the, the, the sudden feeling of having strong opinions at every moment of the story, even down to the phrase level, even down to the level of the comma, when I threw that switch that said, I shall please you, suddenly I, I always knew what to do. Now, was it objectively correct? No. But the, for, the, for the practicing writer, the most deathly state is indecision, where you, you can't hear whether your instrument is in tune or not. You can't understand whether or not you be, you're pleasing the reader. In this new mode, suddenly I kind of by my standards, new. Now, there was a very, there's a bittersweet moment embedded in this. I, I came back to work and almost immediately, excuse me, started working on the stories that would be my first book, Civil War Land. They were very different. They were uh, irreverent. They were sci-fi. They were first person. They were fast. They were full of naughtiness and perversity. Um, but so when I wrote the first one, uh, it was a story called uh, The Wavemaker Falters. And I said a little six-page thing. And I, when I finished it, I thought, oh, and ugh. <laughs> there was a feeling like, you know, I'd been, I'd been going up Hemingway Mountain, trying to stand at Ernest's hallowed side, you know. And, but every time you get up there, you find that he's standing on a little six-inch platform. So no matter how slavishly you try to, to be the modern uh, descendant of Hemingway, you're only standing at his armpit, you know. You, you're making a pale imitation of him. And anyone reading that work would say, oh, yeah, he's kind of a Hemingway guy, you know. So in this moment, I think a metaphor for what happened was I said, I can't do that. I have to come down off that mountain. Uh, Hemingway's voice, Hemingway's uh, mindset won't allow me to express these sacred truths that I'm discovering with my little family. Truths about class, truths about uh, American hypocrisy, truth about op oppression and so on. So you joyfully come off of that mountain. God, what a mistake. Oh, what a silly thing to do. Never do that again. And you come down and in my case, you see Kerouac Mountain. <laughs> ah, there's a working class guy like me, you know. 
<laughs> you go up that one. And there are many, you know, Isaac Bobble Mountain, uh, Henry Green Mountain for a while. But with this production of this first story, um, you know, it was like the, a little shithill appeared. Uh, Saunders, <laughs> a little sign of Saunders. Ugh. So at that point, you make the, I think, a wholly artistic decision, which is, all right, I'm going to go stand on that shithill and I'm going to pray and work so that it will actually rise and become more substantial. Uh, so that was what happened then. Now, let me talk now particularly about, about the, the process by which these stories and books get produced. So simple, it's embarrassing. But basically, uh, the lesson that I learned that day, long ago, was simply this. Um, I'll, I'll come to the text fresh in the morning, print it, it's a printed out text, with a pen in hand. There's an elaborate process to get yourself to the desk, which I won't go into, but you know, it's partly you're self-gaming, you're sort of like, well, you're not writing, you're just sitting at the table. Uh, <laughs> but actually then, at some point, to, to look at the four or five pieces that are in progress, and say, are any of you going to be fun today? And sometimes one will say, I, I might. And you pull that one forward. Sometimes they say, no, we aren't. And I say, well, OK, that's my problem. Are any of you going to be less obnoxious? Which one of you can I do the least damage to today? And one will go, OK. Yeah, done. So then what I found is, as, you know, as language people, we actually have a, um, a strong aversion or attraction to language all the time. You know, if you're like me, you're, you're a billboard editor, you know, or you hear somebody on TV, and, oh, that's a, that's a commas place. The, the, um, is, what I found is if I just let my eyes fall on the first sentence of one of the stories I'm working on, I'm editing right away, right away, even if I don't want to. You know, I see nods. That, at that point, you're writing, by m my definition. So the idea is you get a six or seven page uh, experiment you're working on, very lightly start editing as you go, now, this is maybe the, um, the gist of the whole thing for me is what state of mind are you in when that pencil starts moving? If I'm in an over-conceptualizing, reductive state of mind, I know to be very careful. No, there's a state of mind that says, well, this is a boring section, but it is about patriarchy, so it's okay. It can be boring, you know? Or I'm setting the reader up for 80 pages late. No. It's, it's more a feeling of uh, instantaneous, intuitive response that isn't mediated by re reductive conceptual overlay, if I could put it that way. Uh, it, again, it's hard to describe, but I would say that if I've learned anything over these last 20 years, it's I know when that state of mind is in operation and I know when it's not. When it's not, I still have to keep writing, but I do it with a little bit of caution. Uh, it's sometimes the most trivial, small cuts. Now, this leads me to, uh, let, let me introduce one other concept. Part, another way of saying this is, I imagine there's a meter in my head, essentially, with P over here for positive response coming off the page, and for negative. Part of the job is, in a, almost a meditative way, to step outside of the person who's reading and watch the person who's reading. H how is he doing? It, is, the, uh, is the needle up in the positive? If so, you're good. But of course, inevitably, if you're being honest, honestly watching your own reaction, the needle will drop into the negative zone. At that point, the amateur writer panics and goes back to law school. But, <laughs> but the more seasoned writer turns to the story in a very parental way and says, what's, what's going on there? And the story will say, no, no, we're good. We're good. I'm just putting down some, uh, some, some foundational. No, no, no. What's, what's going on? Well, I'm boring. <laughs> to which the correct response is, oh, <laughs> you are. Well, that's all right, you know. Because as soon as you admit the thing has a defect, then you can come in and fix it. Just that honest state of, like with your kids, you know. Kid comes in miserable from school. What's going on? Nothing. What's going on? Eventually, when you get the answer, then you can, you can somehow address it. Uh, invariably, for me, it's a phrase level correction. Uh, I mean, the, the kind of corny example is just if, if I find myself writing, you know, the cat leapt onto the black table, the dark planar expanse, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, ebony flatness. <laughs> At some point there, I feel like two of those have to go, <laughs> you know. Now why? Partly it's just, it's my preference. But the deeper idea is that what I'm trying to do under this rubric of entertain is to make the most intimate connection I can between me and you, my reader. How do I do that? 
Well, one way is by unceasing respect for your intelligence. In other words, you're just as intelligent and worldly and good-hearted and well-intentioned and flawed as I am. H how can I demonstrate that uh, affection for you through prose? Well, one way is to cut out two of those descriptions of the table because there's a certain quality there uh, of uh, why did I put in the two extra descriptions? Partly to show off a little bit. I'm doing a little dance, and you may or may not have patience for that. Um, but so the idea is that by focusing closely on the text I'm revising, with you in my mind, I show respect for you. What this does is, it, in my, my metaphor, it bonds us together as reader and writer. A bit like, you know, motorcycle sidecar. I, I want you in my sidecar, shoulder to shoulder with me, so that when I go around the corner, you're leaning with me. When we get to a cliff at the end of the story and I go over, if you're sitting there, you are like, well, <laughs> you know. Now, how do we get, how does we make ruptures between us as reader and writer? One way, as I've suggested, is through uh, linguistic laziness, you know, a certain sense of, of um, uh, dancing without regard to your partner in a certain way. Um, we also do it through um, logical problems in the story. Now, I do a lot of, I, I've suggested I'm working on intuition. I also uh, do many, many, many passes through a story. This, in the uh, 10th of December, there's a story called Semco Girl Diaries. It was a 14-year mission. So part of this process of micro-revising is that you do it over and over and over again. Um, when you do that, you're going to rule out the story directions that are less interesting. You're going to rule them out by working on them for four months and polishing them to the best that you can be in. And then one fateful day, you come in and you go, that is not the best corridor to go down. I didn't know that. I couldn't have known that until I polished it. Now I know it. Dear reader, I'm going to spare you this uh, bad diversion. This can sometimes mean seven or eight. Or, I mean, uh, a story called Sea Oak, I had 400 pages of polished endings that didn't work for me, you know. So what this does, I think, is by the time you get to the end of the story, which I try to make, I try to make it look very effortless. You shouldn't feel that sweat equity. It looks like just a natural unfolding, but by the time you get to the end, I have done us the courtesy of ruling out the less meaningful plot directions. So this is a bit like, you know, when you see a slasher film and there's the young couple in the back room in some state of undress, and on the radio it says, there's a killer loose. His MO is to smash through the front window of a house and kill everybody inside. Then the front window of the house smashes in and they both go running toward it. <laughs> That's a moment where the sidecar gets dislocated. You know, you say, I, well, I wouldn't have done that. And so when they get killed, you're like, well, you know. So, so, <laughs> so, so, so part of this process is that every step of the story, I, I want you to say in some form, yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Okay, come along. This, uh, in my experience, this kind of bonding that we do only happens by uh, hundreds, even thousands of iterations through the story. Now, this is interesting to me because I, uh, at this point in my life, I'm not really crazy about this guy. He's 59 years old. I know all his tricks. I know all his little nostalgic mental loops. I know the way I get out of trouble. I know everything. Uh, the person that emerges when I'm writing, though, is a different beast. There's something um, uh, better about, about that person. When you're applying this method, essentially what happens is over many hundreds of days, you're bringing different versions of yourself forward. One day, you hate everything. You don't like language. Stories are stupid. I should have done something more uh, substantial with my life. That person's a pretty good editor, maybe a little too good. Then the next day, I'm so happy. I'm a published author. You know, I think I'll put in a talking poodle. You do that. Uh, another day, you have you you are uh, enraged at the political situation. This story is going to be about politics. You do that. Another day, you're like, that's not art. Isn't about politics. It's all going to be good. We're fine. So, and of course, many many shadings of those of the people that you are. If you become comfortable with this method of revision, what happens is every day a different you shows up and weighs in. And mysteriously, over the thousands of iterations, there is a kind of er you 
that keeps approving certain parts of the message, so those get solidified. By the end of the story, um, my feeling is the very best version of myself is there. Uh, it, I didn't put it there on purpose. I couldn't summon that person up right now. But the magic of this revision process is you find out that you, whatever that is, uh, isn't fixed, isn't stable, and actually over a long period of time can produce a work of art that uh, you never could have imagined at the outset. Um, now, this whole method can be, I have a sort of a troika of mantras that I always invoke at this point. Uh, three writers who have come before me have, have, have intimated this. The first, Donald Barthame, in a great essay called Not Knowing, says the writer is that person who, embarking on her task, has no idea what to do. So the, the, the goal would be, as you work, try to be clear of intentionality. As much as, th there will be intentionality that will come up, but the surface level intentionality is actually not your friend in this model. Uh, Gerald Stern, the poet, said, if you start out to write a poem about two dogs fucking, and you write a poem about two dogs fucking, then you wrote a poem about two dogs fucking. <laughs> and, uh, think about it, <laughs> but, but not too much. <laughs> and then Einstein, ever the smarty pants, he said it very beautifully. Uh, no worthy problem is ever solved in the plane of its original conception. So this means when you start your novel and the novel is to discuss blah, 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 if it simply does that, you will have failed yourself and you'll have failed your, your reader. So the surpri this is a version of no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. Uh, so now, let's, so again, this is not, I promise you this is not every writer's approach, but this is an honest uh, description of mine. Um, to me, the, the story, the way I understand the story now, there's kind of a, there's maybe three things. One is, it's a black box that you, I, I carefully prepared this space uh, for many years per this intuitive method I'm talking about. Kind of like the old definition of porn. I know it when I see it. You know, I don't know what it's going to do to you, but I know it's going to do something. The intention is you come in, you experience something that is not trivial and is powerful. That's really about as far as I like to go in, you know, in my own process. I want it to not be trivial. I want it to be powerful. The addendum is I, I want it to be relevant to you, to your actual life, to the things that you're afraid of and suffering with and aspiring to. Uh, in a sense, the, the, the secondary model is a roller coaster. I don't think the roller coaster guy says, after curve three, he's going to be thinking about impermanence. <laughs> he just wants to kick your ass, essentially. So for me, the, the, um, there's an early period of working on a story where, where I have a little bit of thought about, is this story have enough intellectual heft to justify itself? I know I'm working well when that idea falls away. And when the primary, uh, my primary concern is that you will be riveted and buffeted by the story and come out sort of with, you know, staggering a little bit. That's actually the pole star that I keep my mind on. By now I know if I do that to you, for you, with you, um, then all the other stuff will take care of itself. If you, if you come out of a story stunned, what a world, I promise you we can talk about theme. And we can talk about character, and we can talk about structure, and we can talk about plot. But <laughs> in my view, the, uh, the essential way to talk about those things is how did those things, those reductive concepts, contribute to you staggering out of my story? You know, th then, then you can actually get a handle on this. And I, I teach, for example, the Russian short story with this idea. We read Tolstoy, we talk about uh, what, what did it do to you. Then you can go and you can talk about how it did those, those things to you. The third model, and Michael and I were just talking about this yesterday, and I don't know that it's ever occurred to me before, but I grew up Catholic on the South Side, which is like a double dose Catholic South Side. Uh, and I, I think the, um, the mass, the Catholic mass, taught me something about art. Um, and it, it taught me something viscerally about art. And it's like this. Uh, you know, we go in the church. We just go into church. We go to church. No big deal. You sit down. This an amazing metaphor gets enacted in front of you. This uh, thousand-year-old metaphor. This, uh, it, it's been honed and pruned over all the years by, by hundreds of thousands of people. The church is decorated with cer a certain color scheme. Uh, certain readings are done. And I, even as a little stupid, you know, uh, idiot, basically, I, I could feel uh, 
profound emotional and um, psychological states being enacted during that hour. Uh, every time, almost reliably. Sometimes quite powerfully, actually. Almost mystical levels of things. Uh, I noticed that nobody explained how that happened to me. You just went to church. But, but it was a beautiful work of art uh, that was doing something to my mind state. You go in a nine-year-old kid, and during the process, you would be opened up to what felt to me like generations of wisdom and, and beauty, and you came out a different person. That, to me, is still a pretty good model for what art does. In, in our you know, materialist time, we, uh, we, I think we've, we've overvalued the explanation of affect. You, know, you come off the roller coaster and you start analyzing you know, the, the science of it. But for me, the, the emphasis should be on the reality of the effect the work of art has on you. And from, my, from the producer standpoint, the reality and the validity of the state of mind the artist is in when he produces the product. Even, even if it's a nebulous state of mind. Uh, it, it's a state of mind which is actually anti-conceptual when I'm, when I'm in it. Well, uh, what the mass taught me and later uh, Buddhist um, uh, pujas taught me is that the fact that you can't reduce it doesn't mean it didn't just happen. And in fact, the, the, the mind state that gets induced through art, uh, I can tell you as somebody who's you know, labored to be in that state as much as I can over the last 25 years, that mind state is just as real as, as a more analytical mindset. And of course we know that. When we're rock climbing, we are not doing mathematical calculations. When we dance, we're not, uh, you know, calculating the spin rate. We're, we're not even really saying um, the outside viewer will probably regard this as quite beautiful. We're just dancing, you know. So, so this part of the mind isn't, isn't a surprise to us, but I think um, in a lot of the discussions I read about craft or even criticism, there, there is somewhat of a um, glossing over of this state of mind because, of course, it's very, very hard to talk about and to articulate, but, it, but it's real. Uh, the other thing, and th here I'm, I'll go on thin ice, so if, if I wasn't there all along. Um, there's also something about this, this radical revision thing, this iteration model. Uh, it, it does something strange in the <coughs> relationship, this little troika reader-writer character. We, one way you can look productively at a story is to say, well, where is the reader, the writer, and the character in a kind of power arrangement? Now, my experience is when you first start a story, the writer is way up here. The reader is a little below, and the character is often way down here. Both, we're kind of kicking the character for fun, especially in a comic mode, you're kind of, you know. Um, I would say that the purpose of revising is to draw all three of those entities up into a little love cluster at the top. <laughs> so, first of all, let's talk about the, uh, the the, we have a, already the reader writer. When I'm revising per this model, what I think I'm doing is I'm drawing you up to my level and over to me. Uh, I want you to feel that the language has shown you such respect that we are basically a, a perceiving unit, the two of us together. All, all revisions are done on that basis. How do I show respect for you? You know, I'll, I'll give you. I always do this corny example, but it's and it's a little much, but it, it's. Uh, it, I have an inner nun that helps me with editing, so. <laughs> When I'm trying to respect you, let's say I, I say, uh, Frank came into the room and sat down on the brown couch. Perfectly workable English sentence. But let's start trying to edit it with a mind to respect. I would say that for me to say Frank comes into the room is insulting to you. Why? Because if he sat on the couch, it's implied. Now that sounds small, but let's take it out. Okay, so Frank sat down on the brown couch. Okay. Mm. Somehow the word down, we don't need it. You say, Frank sat on the brown couch. It's exactly equal to Frank sat down on the brown couch. I, my claim is, when you're writing fiction, <coughs> the, the battle is fought on the level of the word. If I cut down, cut the word down, I have shown you some tiny percentage more respect. And I, and I claim that you feel that. You may not intellectually know it, but you feel it. Frank sat on the brown couch. Now we're entering into Hemingway-esque territory. It's, it's brisk, it's lean. Brown? Is it meaningful? Not that I know of. Frank sat on the couch. Now that sentence is now half the length. And I would argue that if you read a book of sentences fashioned on the first lazy model 
and a book fashioned on the second model, the second one is better. The second one communicates more respect for you. But I'm not done yet because also, why do I care if Frank sat on a couch? So I cut it and I just get Frank. You know? <laughs> but, but, but we don't stink yet. We, in other words, we haven't surrendered to banality yet. You know? So this kind of mind is, when I say respect, that's what I'm talking about. Is I, I want you, if there's anything we mutually assume, I don't want to say it. If there's anything I've already said, I don't want to say it again. Uh, if there's any lazy wordplay, uh, cliche, I want to cut that out. So now, reader and writer together. What about the character? Same thing applies. Um, the reason the character is down there often, I would say always, is because your language toward the character has been inattentive. Inattentive to what? <clears throat> inattentive to that character's three-dimensional human reality. Uh, again, an example, uh, start my novel, my next novel, uh, called Frank, uh, and, and I'll start it with, Frank was an asshole. Okay, it's a sentence, you know, but the gods of fiction don't like that sentence very much. Uh, they they, they want to, they say, Frank was an asshole? They talk like that. Uh, <laughs> yes, he was. How so? And then you're, you're obliged to produce a reason. Frank was an asshole, and then that's, again, the magic moment where you are just riffing. You're not deciding, you're riffing. Frank was an asshole, uh, he insulted a young barista. Okay, F and let's, let's cut the asshole part out, just to not be gratuitous. Frank insulted the young barista. Okay, so first of all, we want to know what he said. But for now, let's leave it like that. The gods of fiction say, why do you think he did that? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so you complete the sentence. Uh, Frank insulted the young barista who reminded him of his wi dead wife. Now, suddenly, in just two brushstrokes that were ostensibly to make the language better, <clears throat> we've gone from Frank, who's just a throwaway down below us, to somebody who is so capable of love that when he lost the object of his love, he became incapable of basic function, you know, basic kindness. That guy's more interesting to me. He still might come under the category of asshole, but he's a specific asshole. And I think if you, you know, think about how you regarded him when I first said that and how you regard him now, he's come up. And ideally, you could get the three uh, reader-writer character, uh, those three people all clustered together. That's, I think, where beautiful fiction happens. It doesn't mean that you have to be positive towards Frank. You, know, you think of Flannery O'Connor's work. We don't uh, love those people, but they're, they're three-dimensional. They're right there with us. Uh, Flannery O'Connor doesn't give them cheap stupidity. She gives them profound stupidity, and then we can, we can have some fun. So I think I'll, I'll pause there and be happy to talk, uh, uh, answer questions. For me, the, the thing I, I just restate is that the years of laboring in the vineyard have taught me that there's a state of mind that we go into when doing art that is 100% real and valid. Uh, and actually, it's, it's very powerful. And in our political time, this, uh, the allegiance to specificity and detail and a kind of empathetic abiding are actually, I think, the things that fiction can, can bring to the wider culture. This idea that the first, you know, the first pass of our projective uh, imagination of reality is often lacking. You know, in other words, when somebody cuts you off in traffic, you know what political party they belong to. <laughs> but fiction is kind of a slow motion, um, opportunity like in the matrix you know to slow time down re-examine our basic concepts through this process of revision and in the end the model of the universe that gets produced is going to be more specific more detailed often more ambiguous it often er it, it urges us to act a little more slowly to suspend judgment uh, all of which at least in my practice have slowly slowly uh, eked out into my real life in a very very satisfying way so I'll stop there thank you <coughs>